Directors Phil Lord and Christopher Miller in a recent interview shared new information about Beyond the Spider-Verse, which will be the final part of the trilogy. It is expected to premiere next year. It was originally scheduled to release on March 29th, 2024. But due to a lack of adequate production progress, Lord and Miller stated that development would take as long as needed to meet their standards. So don't be surprised if the premiere is postponed to 2025. Sony initially announced the sequel even before the release of Into the Spider-Verse. Spider-Verse and eventually decided to split it into two movies. Therefore, the development of the threequel was carried out in parallel with the second. Most likely, after the end of the Spider-Verse trilogy, Sony will start actively promoting a full-length movie about Miles Morales with live-action actors, which has also been officially announced. But let's not guess that far, because the plans of a studio like Sony can change hundreds more times. Think of Silk and El Muerte. But nevertheless, now you will learn about everything that is known about Beyond the Spider-Verse. It's going to be very interesting and intriguing. So let's get started right away. What do you know about Chekhov's gun? It is a principle that very often underlies books, movies, and games. It goes like this. The gun shown in the first act must definitely fire in the third. Cannot understand anything? Let me explain. By gun, here mean not a particular thing, but a storyline. For example, Spider-Verse Dilogy contains a couple of Chekhov's guns. The first has to do with the spider that bit Miles Morales. Since the first part, we are clearly shown the number 42 to now remind the audience again that Morales is essentially an anomaly, for this spider had to bite this variant of Miles. A spider that came from Earth-42 may contain a lot of clues. Shown in the first act, what Into the Spider-Verse is, it should change the course of the plot at the very end, in Beyond the Spider-Verse. But we'll come back to that. After all, the sequel sort of answered a lot of questions, but raised just as many. In order not to get confused, let's start in order. According to Miguel O'Hara's logic, the whole fate is already predetermined, and Miles' father, having become a captain, must die anyway. This is a canon event, which cannot be influenced. That's understandable, but does this apply to all Spider-Mans? Using the example of Indian Spider-Man, we were shown what is spreading. But is there really not 1% chance that Morales' dad could survive? Of course there is, and Miguel is most likely just wrong. Or he's not who he says he is. When he explained the rules of Spider-Verse, all versions of Spider-Man just silently confirmed everything, and no one even argued with it, except Miles. But then how to explain the situation with Gwen? Why does her father and her entire reality still exist? Why was she still freely traveling to Earth-6 T-10, since Into the Spider-Verse? And where was Miguel at that moment? Well, okay, let's say it was necessary detail for the plot, but then the whole concept of the multiverse doesn't work as strictly as it's described. We're shown that Gwen's father is now retired, and he logically stays alive, although he was originally supposed to die. But is it really that simple? It means that if Miles' dad does doesn't become captain, he will also remain alive. There's no mystery here. And again, Miguel was wrong. He ignores an awful lot of detail, focusing all his attention on Miles, maniacally wanting his dad to die. Yes! In the comics, he was a complex character who was different from all the variants of Spider-Man. O'Hara originally worked for Alchemax and conducted various experiments on humans that failed. By refusing to continue such experiments, he pissed off the company bosses and he was tricked into taking a powerful drug known as Rapture. To get rid of his addiction, Miguel decides to experiment on himself by mixing his DNA with that of Spider-Man. Yes, in 2099, Peter Parker was a legendary hero who was the idol of many, including O'Hara. The process will go well, but with side effects. He gets horrible claws and vampire fangs. And at the moment when Miguel injects himself, most likely he is thus fueling his superpowers with extra doses of Spider-Man DNA. But one moment made me think a lot. I didn't notice this when I first watched Across the Spider-Verse in cinema, but upon re watching it at home, I found one interesting detail hinting that Miguel is not who he says he is. When the spiders first go to O'Hara, Spider-Punk steals some parts from his lab, after which a warning even pops up, stating that memory block ejected. This small detail could play a huge role in Beyond the Spider-Verse, as the memory block could contain all sorts of information about Miguel's real plan. To deflect attention from himself, Hobby tells Miles that there's nothing important here. But when Miles asks in a little more detail about this, Hobby replies that he ain't got Scooby-Doo. And what's that? I ain't got Scooby-Doo, mate. That's what they want. 
With exactly the same phrase in No Way Home, Doctor Strange asked Spider-Man to catch the villains. Scooby-Doo this shit! I don't think I need to explain that the slang for Scooby-Doo means clue, and it's very interesting detail, because in Scooby-Doo, the characters caught various creatures that always turned out to be not who they said they were. So this phrase could be a hint that this Miguel O'Hara is not who he says he is. I'm not hyping a theory that he'll end up being some sort of Moreland, which is all over Reddit. Still, I think Hobby clearly knows more than he's letting on, and he'll definitely play a bigger role in Beyond the Spider-Verse. He also took Miles' side without any questions, and even helped Gwen greatly by leaving her as Portal Watch. This clearly shows that Spider-Punk knew everything about what Miguel was up to from the very beginning. It will be interesting to find out what dark secret Spider-Man 2099 is hiding. After all, Theron, you will be convinced several more times that he was simply wrong about everything. The plot itself showed us that Spider-Verse is a unique system that can work in different ways, and the characters have already broken the rules so many times that the death of Miles' father can no longer be perceived as the end point. Gwen and Peter realize at the end that sometimes it's worth breaking the rules, especially when they're questionable. It is a big mistake that canon events cannot be influenced, and that they must inevitably happen. And here we come back to Chekhov's gun, to the spider that bit Morales. Still, Miles' anomalous transformation into Spider-Man led to good outcomes. He himself believes that the dimension can still be saved even after the canon change. This is the main conflict in Across the Spider-Verse, and I get the distinct impression that Miguel is clearly missing something. Miles escapes him, and the go-home machine identifies him as Spider-Man from Earth-42. Therein lies the clue to the whole thing. As a result, Miles found himself in a foreign reality. You already know this very well. There is no spider Spider-Man in this New York because the spider has already bitten the wrong Miles. Because of this, the crime rate here is off the charts and Prowler is the icing on the cake. Beyond the Spider-Verse should begin with events on Earth-42. This could be a massive battle between the two Miles, and then the Prowler will be revealed to us more. Why he became like this and how his father died. But essentially, you can't blame the Prowler here because Earth-42's New York is such a depressing place that it's completely controlled by the Sinister Six. This is hinted at by a news bundle in which J. Joe Jonah Jameson openly states that the city is under havoc because of Sinister Six Cartel. But also, as Miles swings to his home, you can see a bunch of Easter eggs. In this universe, there's a tech company called Electronics, the capital letters of which hint at Electra. Instead of Oscorp, there's Scorpo, owned by Scorpion instead of Norman Osborn. And on the building nearby, there is a logo with the number eight. So Otto Octavius apparently has his own company too. Even Rhino owns his own casino here called Rhino Casino. And his direct competitor is Sandman, who has his own slots and hotels. Tell. All this mess happened because the spider that was supposed to bite this Miles got to Earth 1610 back and in into the Spider-Verse. Think again about Chekhov's gun, and by Miguel's logic, whole Earth 42 should be erased, but as we see, it's not. And here we realize again that O'Hara was wrong, well, or just ignored this one. The Prowler will see his past reflection in Miles from 1610, and in his zeal to save his father, he will recognize his past motives. And for the original Miles, it will be a kind of persona of his future without his dad, and a life in which Spider-Man was never able to save a loved one. So this thought will motivate him to move on and ignore all of Miguel's arguments. He will try his best to reason with his alternative variant, and the relationship between them will be a key storyline in the first 10 minutes of Beyond the Spider-Verse. The peculiarity of Miles' path is the desire to live his own life, and not depend on what others are trying to impose on him. He chose college on his own and always did things that were important to him. The decision to save his dad is explained by by the fact that he himself will write his own story. In that case, the bottom line is that the rescue will be a competent conclusion to an entire trilogy, and it seems to me that everything will be so. For what then is the point of all this mess? The story must be wrapped up so that Miles' dad survives. Otherwise, Miguel will be right, and everything Morales fought for will be complete nonsense. But that doesn't mean we're in for a complete happy ending with no touching moments. Obviously, one of the key characters will die, sacrificing himself, and Gwen is the most suitable for this role, according to most. It would be a tribute to the classic comics. Gwen herself has mentioned that she's not meant to be together with Spider-Man in more than one timeline. The drama in this outcome will be very high, but I still want to believe that there really is no specific pattern, and we will be shown that Spider-Verse can be chaotic, as I said earlier, from which the characters are free to choose their own fates. So Gwen's death, although canonical, will simply be inappropriate, in my opinion. Here, everything will be at the will of the screenwriters. It's also been stated that alternate Gwens will appear 
and beyond the Spider-Verse, and that's such good food for thought. Perhaps Miles isn't the only one who will have to face a broken version of himself. Personally, I'd love to see a Carnage Gwen. This happened in the comics when Otto Octavius cloned her by adding symbiote DNA. But that's just my own wish, not a full-fledged theory. As for Squad of Spider-Man 2099, they will continue to pursue Miles. Miguel will quickly realize that Miles is not on Earth 1610, and they'll head to Earth 42. He will try to disrupt Miles' plans to save his dad. Still, I personally think Morales will prove O'Hara wrong all along, and then he'll reconsider. After all, Miguel cannot be called absolute evil, and it would not be a surprise if he also goes over to Miles' side. As for who will remain the real villain, it's Spot. Most likely his concept will be the same. He's already become damn powerful in the finale of Across the Spider-Verse. We've already been shown his powers when he easily opened portals to other Earths, and in the threequel, the authors may show how Spot will pull villains from different realities by creating his own sinister team of the most terrible and dangerous versions of Spider-Man villains, and we may well see a massive battle of Spider-Man team versus the villains. It seems to me that the plot will be something like this, but there's another theory. Miles will save his father, thereby destroying the entire multiverse, after which the rift will be unstoppable, and the Spider-Verse trilogy will lead viewers to Avengers Secret Wars. I don't want it to be this way, but many insiders a couple of months ago talked about the appearance of Spider-Verse characters in the sixth Avengers, and it was even hinted at by Amy Pascal and Kevin Feige. Yes, it sounds quite controversial, but very realistic. No Way Home has already made Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield canon in MCU. Doctor Strange 2 showed Professor X, and next year, Deadpool 3 will return Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. Get the point? There's nothing stopping Sony from partnering with Disney again to make the entire Spider-Verse part of Secret Wars. As cool as that sounds, again, I personally wouldn't want that to happen. I'll quickly explain why. Honestly, I didn't like how they showed us Garfield and Donald Glover's Prowler in Across the Spider-Verse. They looked, frankly, weird. By that logic, Miles could appear in Secret Wars in animated form, and it would look dumb. Different animation styles are what we all love about Spider-Verse, but when animation becomes part of live action, it ruins everything. So I wouldn't want all these characters to move into Avengers 6 unchanged. MCU should further tell its own story, especially when they already have their live action Spider-Man. Add the Spider-Trio there and play with the symbiotes. Overall, I'm expecting Beyond the Spider-Verse to develop the relationships between the characters and a full-blown climax with an incredibly touching ending. Spider-Verse has the potential to be one of the best, if not the best, superhero trilogy ever. At the very least, the sequel once again proved that Sony can make worthy projects without going into complete fan service. And you in the comments offer your variants of storylines. What would you like to see, and do you have your own theory? Feel free to write even your craziest thoughts. After all, anything can happen in Beyond the Spider-Verse. Subscribe.